Hi guys, we're back to talk more about water resources. Um, so let me share my screen again. Um, and then let's actually back up here. Um, okay, so we're trying to think about now kind of what we use our water for and um, as it was just showing on this previous slide, um, far and away the biggest use that we have for water in our society is to grow food um, that you know, we ultimately consume. Um, so globally about 70% of water goes to agriculture. In California that's even a little bit higher, about 80%. And then about 24% is industry, so that's both energy production and also other kinds of manufacturing. And then 6% is household use, so that's flushing the toilet, taking a shower, watering your lawn, um, and all the other things that you use water for in your home. So you can see that agriculture really dwarfs all the other kinds of uses um, that we have for water. And so this kind of um, starts, brings us to this, some discussion about, you know, how can we influence um, water use to think about um, how we might improve our water uh, availability and improve our water use efficiency. And as we do that, it's important to draw some distinction between two different types of water use. The first one being consumptive use and the second one being non-consumptive use. So consumptive use of water is um, when something is used and then right after it's used, it cannot be reused. So of course, a lot of the water molecules are not disappearing. Um, you know, they might go back up into the sky and then form clouds and come back down as precipitation. So I'm not saying they can never be reused, but we don't kind of have a hold on that pool of water anymore. And this would be agriculture. If we water our fields, we can't, you know, put a tray beneath um, the roots of the plants and capture the water and then, you know, put it into some other kind of use after that. So once we use it, it's gone. And that's different than some sorts of water uses, which are called non-consumptive uses, and actually many manufacturing uses are in this vein. And these would be um, things where you use the water, but then once you use it, you still have it. So then you could maybe use it again for something else. So this would be true of like water that we pull in from rivers as a coolant in power plants, um, which is one of the major industrial uses. So we move this water through and now we've heated it up so that's a form of thermal pollution that we'll talk about next week, but we still have the water to use potentially to um, use in agriculture or to use in some sort of industrial setting. And this would also be true for like hydropower. If we have a bunch of water that we're holding behind a dam and then we run it through hydropower turbines, we can create energy, but the water's not gone. It could still go downstream and go to another use or um, another use, quote unquote, of uh, water is just called environmental use. And so this is the water that we just allow to run downstream without kind of allocating for any specific um, kind of consumptive withdrawal. So, you know, just the minimum amount of water that we want to be in the stream for wildlife and kind of ecosystem function. Um, okay, so we know that we use a lot of water um, in, Agricultural settings, we know not all water use is the same. So then let's think a little bit about how much water do we actually need? So on the left, um, there is a diagram that's showing kind of how much water do we need just to drink, right? As humans to eat or ingest with, within our food. And that's somewhere around two to four liters, which is similar to like a quart, right? Like a two liter, well, we'll see like a two liter soda bottle or something. That's about how much water we should be ingesting just to stay alive. Of course, we need more than that if we want to think about what are our kind of basic cooking and cleaning and sanitation needs. We need to be able to wash our dishes, wash our hands, um, things like that. And so if we consider that kind of personal household use, that would be up to like 20 to 50 liters, about 10 times that amount. And then, um, as we've already discussed, agricultural use is far and away a much higher amount required, has a much higher amount required. And so the amount to produce our daily food is more like 2,000 to 4,000 liters per person. So this is a much, much, much bigger use. 
um, a lot of people in the world don't have, of course, access to some of this basic water um, requirement. So um, studies from the UN have shown things like of over a billion people don't have access to that basic two to four liters of safe, clean drinking water each day. And then a much higher amount, about 2.5 billion people, so about a third of the people um, on the earth, don't have access to that um, fundamental 20 to 50 liters of clean water for basic cooking needs. And so you start to understand why water is such a kind of geopolitically important resource. Um, and then, of course, some other people use a whole lot more water than they really need. Um, and on the top here, I have a diagram showing different countries. Um, and this is the amount of water used per person per day um, for these kind of basic cooking, cleaning, household uses. So this is not including the, the water that goes into producing food. And the U.S., unsurprisingly, is kind of leading um, the charge. Um, we have almost... Um, 575 liters per person per day that we use on average in our homes. Okay, so that's like about 10 times what's required and much higher um, than we see in many other countries, although several other industrial countries are up there using high amounts of water as well. Um, okay, so if, if we do want to make a big difference, we certainly can see People like us, like in the United States, use more on average than they need in their home. So we can be more efficient with the way that we water our lawns and the way that we wash our dishes. But the biggest impact that we can have is on our food choices. And so when we talked about food earlier, we um, acknowledged the idea that food, different types of food require different kind of resource inputs. And that's both true in kind of terms of their, their carbon footprint, but certainly their water footprint as well. So things like lettuce require about, sorry, one second. Excuse me. Okay, sorry. Um, water requires about 130 liters to produce one kilogram of lettuce, and then it kind of goes up from there. So certain things like lettuce, tomatoes, cabbage, squash, potatoes, and many of these kind of annual crop plants have a higher water use efficiency, or basically we're getting more like plant food material per water input. Um, many things that are kind of um, like corn or bread, grains are a little higher. Things that are um, tree crops like nuts or um, different kinds of fruit that grow on trees would be a little bit higher. And then meat is much, much, much higher because you have to think about all the water that goes into growing all the food that you harvest to feed all the animals plus all the water that the animals are drinking. So we've learned like eating higher up on the trophic system is not as efficient from a um, resource use standpoint. And then certain kinds of crops like rice or chocolate um, even though their plants are just adapted to grow in much wetter environments. And so they have a much, a much bigger water use demand. But anyway, you can certainly see how, you know, choosing to have potatoes and squash for dinner is something that's going to be requiring a much lower water use input than choosing to have beef and chocolate for dinner. Um, okay, so we know that um, there are increasingly more and more people living on the planet. We know that there is a scarcity of water um, already, and we worry that that may get worse, um, both with an increasing population and with a changing global climate. Um, the United Nations FAO, which is the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, predicts that by 2025, which is not so far from now, about 1.8 people will be living with extreme water scarcity, and about two-thirds of all humans will experience some sort of inconvenience because of water scarcity. So that's a lot. Um, the Western United States Western U.S. is certainly an area that will experience water scarcity. We have already experienced um, water scarcity with past droughts that have caused us to really cut back on water, which influences different kinds of economic sectors, mainly agriculture. Um, and we know that we will likely experience less overall precipitation coming into California in the future. Um, what we understand about global climate change is that areas that are already drier will likely become more dry as warmer air holds on to moisture 
a um, little bit more aggressively and doesn't release it as rain as easily. We also know that even if we did have not a huge drop off in our total amount of precipitation, more will be coming as rain as opposed to snow. And in the last segment, we talked about the importance of snowpack acting as a reservoir in our current system. So we'll lose that water storage capacity. And then we just continue to have more and more people living here. And so all of those kind of come together to create this perfect storm of scarcity, not enough water um, to kind of go around to meet the desires of all the people in the society. So there is kind of a famous quote that's often um, attributed to Mark Twain, although there's not really any documented connection as far as I can tell searching around, um, but that is whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting over. And this is not only true in California, um, but true in many parts of the Middle East and other places where we're experiencing um, conflicts already over water and water access. Okay, so what do we do when we have lots of people who need lots of water and have an expectation that they'll have lots of water? Um, one of the things that we've done in the past is that we have invested in these massive diversion and storage products, um, projects, excuse me. So California, um, up until pretty recently, had one of the most uh, massive water infrastructure um, systems on the planet. China has been doing a lot of work to build up their water infrastructure as well as some countries in South America as well. Um, but here's a small map of California or kind of a simplified map of California showing some of the major diversion projects. So first of all, we move water into San Francisco all the way from Yosemite. Um, a lot of people are familiar with Hetch Hetchy, a big reservoir in um, the northern part of Yosemite National Park, and that's water storage that goes all the way across the Central Valley into San Francisco. Um, the LA Basin pulls water all the way from the Colorado River, um, as well as from the Eastern Sierra, um, kind of draining water all the way up from the Mono Lake area and the Owens Valley area. And then I already mentioned this Colorado uh, River water diversion project that brings water into the LA Basin. Um, and then we have a massive Central Valley project as well as a state water project. So a federal and a state water project that move water through like the Feather River system and then through the California aqueduct into the central, um, Southern Central Valley. Um, that's a state water project. And then there's a big federal water project that moves water from like um, more coast, Northern coastal areas um, like the Shasta reservoirs and the Trinity reservoirs. So there has been an enormous investment over the last hundred years in moving water around to where um, people need it, but we continue to have more people, more demand, less water coming in. And so they were kind of um, really pushing up against the limitations of the system, which is also aging um, to kind of provide the needs that we have. Um, so in all these diversion projects, we've built a lot of dams to store a lot of water in reservoirs behind these dams. And there are certainly benefits to dams, which is why we have invested them, invested in them in the first place. Um, first of all, a lot of these dams are used to make hydropower. And in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about energy. And hydropower is one of the main sources of renewable energy that we have access to. Um, storing water in reservoirs also allows us to kind of dole that water out um, in times of the year where we might not have precipitation for irrigation and other community use. And then also a lot of times dams have a capacity to um, do some flood control. So if we do have a bunch of water running into a um, river system all at the same time and we have a bunch of people living along the river downstream, we can hold some of that water back and release it more slowly to protect people downstream. So those are all benefits. However, there are a lot of ca um, costs to putting these big diversion projects and dams in as well. So the main um, cost is to kind of the environment and the, particularly the fish, organisms that are trying to move up and down the rivers are significantly impacted by putting massive diversions in the middle of the rivers. And so um, we know that the fisheries in places like California have dropped precipitously in the last hundred years. And that's probably not exclusively because of dams. It's also just because of 
lot of people and other pollution and things like that. But putting these big barriers in the middle of rivers has had a hugely negative impact on fish populations in places like the West Coast. And um, even if fish are allowed to get by through the construction of things like river ladders, uh, or sorry, fish ladders on dams, the environmental conditions are permanently changed by putting these big um, dam infrastructures in rivers. So the water temperature that's held behind the dam is changing. Um, so the surface water gets really hot as it is sitting out in the summer. And then the water deep down in the dam is very cold. And so depending on the part of the um, reservoir that the water is being released from, the water might be colder or warmer than it would be in kind of a natural water setting, which can be problematic for organisms. And also these dams block a lot of natural sediment that is an important nutrient um, in a lot of river systems. So anyway, there's certainly some drawbacks to putting dams in or costs to putting dams in. Um, and then the other thing is dams are just hugely expensive. They're huge upfront investments and then they're huge long-term investments because they require a lot of upkeep. Um, so about one third of the world's largest dams were not considered um, economically really feasible. They were huge um, kind of subsidized projects um, that didn't actually produce kind of enough economic um, margin to be able to pay for themselves. And so when we're making such a huge diversion um, at such an environmental cost, it's interesting for us to at least consider um, if this is a huge financial cost as well, is this always the best choice? And a lot of times we're finding maybe it's not. Um, so it, in the comment about the fact that um, dams can block sediment, there's been some interesting um, changes that are going on in the Mississippi River area, um, which is of course a river that drains a huge part of the central United States. And um, the channelized Mississippi moves more sediment um, than before and upstream dams block a lot of the sediment. So all these dams along the Mississippi River are basically capturing a whole lot of sediment that's coming into the river. And um, because they're capturing so much sediment upstream, the land along the mouth of the Mississippi River is actually getting smaller because it's not um, causing the sediment that used to kind of recharge and refill these wetland areas is not being delivered. And so the Mississippi loses about a football field um, of sediment and of land area that would have been covered with sediment into the ocean every hour. Um, so here's a map of this area in the 1830s compared to today. Um, so this is a huge change and this is something that we're not only seeing in places like the United States, but other areas as well. So that's kind of an interesting thing about dams you might not have considered. Um, and then as we're saying, there's a lot of controversy about some of the environmental costs as well as just the financial costs of upkeep of these dams. And so interestingly, we're at a stage now where um, at least in the United States, we're actually taking down dams more often than we're putting them up. That's not true in places like China. Um, but so far, um, over a thousand dams have been removed in the United States. Um, the Elwa and the Glines Canyon Dam were kind of famously removed in Olympic National Park, and I'll put a little video clip that you can watch um, in the module about this dam removal project. Um, in California, there's been a lot of controversy about four dams along the Klamath River, and um, there's been a lot of litigation about this over the last decade, but um, the last update is that these dams are just um, old, they're aging, they're really not economic anymore, um, and so they're slated to come out. And so of course, this is a hugely complicated engineering feat, um, but it seems like both financially and environmentally in the long run that it makes sense to try to take these dams out. So that's a project you can kind of keep your eyes on um, in the future. This is a picture of one of the four um, dams on the Klamath that's slated to come out called the Iron Gate Dam. Okay, so we know there's um, a limitation on the water, certainly a limitation on surface water. So what can we do to be more conscientious and more efficient with the water that we have access to, especially if we imagine we might have less water to go around for more people in the future. And hopefully you're already understanding that probably the first and most important thing we can do is make um, important 
um, and water efficient food choices. So eat less um, or eat less conventionally raised meat, right? If we're eating meat that's eating some sort of grain that's farmed, then that's a very inefficient use of water. Um, and then we can also think about other ways to eat more kind of water efficient crops. So our food choices are hugely important. Um, energy production is also a big use of um, big use of water. So being more energy efficient is also going to help us be more water efficient. And then we already learned that water use in the household is actually a small fraction of the overall use, but that doesn't mean that we can't make improvements there. So in your home, <laughs> you can do things like get rid of your lawn or minimize um, the water that you have for your outside landscapes. Um, so 30% of the water in um, your home goes to, um, you know, outside watering. Um, and then flushing the toilet is the next biggest use at um, 26%. So if it's yellow, let it mellow, right? You don't need to flush the toilet necessarily every time. Um, and then the next biggest, bathing, shorter showers, fewer showers, and then kind of more efficient appliances are important, but really have a lower impact than all these other things that we've talked about. Um, okay, so that's all I have to say about that.